living la vida loca. This show is changing lives. We talking about your diet, trying to get you feeling right. Cut up them avocados, fry some eggs. Time to explore the longest running health podcast, hosted by Jimmy Moore. Time to give up the crappy garbage. We're getting into ketosis. Every day is a new step to your goal. Yeah, you're getting closer. Motivated and focused. Don't stop, just go. Time to get inspiration from the living la vida low carb show. Hey. The Living Low Carb Show.com. So today, you guys, I have a brand new study that I think you're going to find very, very interesting if you're one of those people that has higher LDL cholesterol. And when you eat a low-carb diet, a ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, a lot of people complain because they see their LDL cholesterol go up. And so this new study, which I'm featuring here today on Jimmy Make Science Simple, Go follow me over on Instagram at Jimmy Makes Science Simple, and you will be the first ones to get to watch these live. Uh, and and then we air them on my podcast. But this study, you guys, was published in the November 2021 issue of the journal Current Developments in Nutrition. The title of the study: Elevated LDL Cholesterol with a Carbohydrate Restricted Diet: Evidence for a Lean Mass Hyperresponder Phenotype. Now, we'll explain what all that means here in just a moment. The researchers, I know most of these people, uh, Nicholas Norwitz, he's a doctor. Dave Feldman, who uh, is from the Cholesterol Code website, has been doing a lot of N equals 1 testing of himself with this very topic. Adrian Soto uh, Mota, I don't know who that is. Uh, Tro Kalajian, that's Dr. Tro, I know him. And then... Uh, as we featured in last week's episode, Dr. David Ludwig. Dr. Ludwig, I have to give this man credit because he wasn't always fully on board with doing studies of low-carb ketogenic diets, um, but now he is. Now he's really putting his, his, I guess, scientific moxie out there and saying, hey, let's give these nutritional modalities a chance to be researched. And so now he's being a part of that research. So let's get into the paper itself. Background. People commencing a carbohydrate-restricted diet experience a markedly heterogeneous response in LDL cholesterol, ranging from extreme elevations to a reduction. So what they're saying is, if you go on a low-carb diet, some people will have a hyper response where the LDL-C tends to go up. And then other people go on a ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, a low-carb diet, and they actually see their LDLC go dramatically down. So that's the background. So the objective of this study is to elucidate possible sources of heterogeneity in the LDLC response to a carbohydrate-restricted diet and thereby identify who the individuals are that may be at risk for this elevation in the LDLC. Now, let let me give a little side note here. I wrote a book many years ago, almost a decade ago now. This book came out, Cholesterol Clarity, What the HDL is Wrong with My Numbers. And one of the things that I talked about in this book 10 years ago uh, was how everything we think we know about cholesterol and what the numbers mean and what's relevant is not relevant. And we knew that information 10 years ago. And so... Yes, LDLC may go up, but what does that mean? LDLC in and of itself really isn't a risk marker of concern. Even though your doctor goes crazy about it being high, goes crazy about your total cholesterol being high, when we know it's the quality of the LDL particle uh, and you find out the quality and the particle number and the particle size by running a test called NMR lipoprofile, and you get that run and you can see the quality of the LDL, how many particles uh, are in there. Also, what the size uh, ratio is. So you're looking for pattern A, which is mostly the large fluffy kind. You're trying to avoid pattern B, which is a preponderance of small dense LDL particles. And those are what are atherogenic, what causes uh, heart attacks and, and heart disease. And so, For us to try to identify why do some people get LDLC to go up and others it normalizes, I almost kind of go, who cares? But from a scientific uh, curiosity perspective, the researchers in this paper cared and they wanted to see why. Okay, so 
Let's see what we got here. Buh, 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 buh. All right, so let's get into the study itself. The introduction. Carbohydrate-restricted diets hold promise for weight loss, type 2 diabetes, and other chronic health conditions, but this dietary strategy may cause elevated LDL cholesterol, also known as LDLC, which they say is an important risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. <sighs> that statement is debatable. I know mainstream medicine and the mainstream cardiovascular world, they look at LDLC as the marker of your cardiovascular health. I would argue that triglycerides is a much better marker of your cardiovascular health. And triglycerides are not usually taken into account. Uh, they give lip service to triglycerides, but they really don't give the credence of triglycerides near like they do LDLC. Some studies report a marked increase in LDLC with the consumption of a carbohydrate restricted diet, which is true. We have seen that in studies. However, others show that there's no clinically meaningful increase at all. The sources and the mechanistic basis of heterogeneity is in response to carbohydrate restriction among studies and among individuals are poorly characterized, limiting translation of this dietary strategy to public health and patient care. I would argue that the biggest reason why people avoid ketogenic diets, low carb diets like Atkins, um, even paleo, uh, and especially carnivore, the main reason why people avoid these diets is they're worried about the increase in their cholesterol, specifically their LDLC, and their perceived risk of heart disease as a result of that. This is why people avoid it. If you could eliminate the whole fear about saturated fat, raising cholesterol, cholesterol increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease, we would have a lot more people buy into low carb diets, um, ketogenic diets, carnivore diets, and even paleo. Plausible sources of heterogeneity include ratio of saturated fat to unsaturated fat content. Some people say maybe eat less saturated fat and that will lower your LDLC. That could be a cause. Genetic susceptibility, the genetic factor always has to be put into play. The degree of carbohydrate restriction differentiating between moderately restrictive low carb, which is somewhere between 50 to 130 grams a day of carbohydrate versus the more intensively restricted, very low carb ketogenic approach, which is generally under 50 grams a day. And that's true. If you're still eating a higher number of carbohydrates, perhaps that's exacerbating it. So I'm glad that they're teasing that out. A novel source of inner individual heterogeneity may uh, also involve metabolic health. Uh, many studies of uh, carbohydrate restricted diets involve patients with obesity, metabolic syndrome, also insulin resistance, or type two diabetes. Conditions all associated with having adverse metabolic health markers, all of them related to insulin resistance, most notably low HDL cholesterol, the HDLC, and high triglycerides. Those are the markers. Among those participants, relatively minor LDLC elevations have been observed. For example, in a non randomized study, including 262 patients with type 2 diabetes consuming a very low carb diet. LDLC increased by just 11 milligrams per deciliter after two years. That's minimal, that's basically negligible. Similarly, in a randomized crossover trial, including participants with obesity and metabolic syndrome, isocaloric, meaning same calories, substitution of fat for carbohydrate did not raise their LDLC despite the twofold increase in saturated fat. So that kind of sticks a dagger in the if they eat more saturated fat, it's gonna raise their LDL cholesterol, and yet that's what's commonly thought. By contrast, listen to this, you guys. Among lean and metabolically healthy participants, in other words, no obesity, no insulin resistance, market elevations in LDLC have been reported. In an observational study of 20 ultra-endurance runners, those who regularly consumed a 10% versus 57% carbohydrate diet had a substantially higher LDLC, 
161 for the people who had the 10% carbohydrate diet versus 88 for the one that ate 57% of their diet as carbohydrates with striking consistency within the groups. In a four-week crossover feeding study of 17 lean, healthy young women, a very low-carb diet also increased their LDL by 70 milligrams per deciliter compared to eating the standard diet. Notably, all the participants exhibited an increase in their LDLC when they ate a very low carb diet. So this is this is what they were talking about with the lean mass hyper responders. So these are people that have no obesity, they have no chronic disease, they're basically insulin sensitive, and yet they go on a low carb ketogenic diet and they're seeing massive increases in their LDLC. So what they're seeking to learn in this study is, why is that? What are they doing? What is it about those people that makes them have these spikes in the LDLC? And I guess the greater question is, does it matter? Is it harming them in some way? We're gonna find out in this study. Based on anecdotal reports in social media communities of carbohydrate-restricted diet consumers, one co-author proposed in 20, uh, that's Dave Feldman, proposed in 2017 the existence of this lean mass hyperresponder uh, as a specific phenotype defined as having an LDLC of over 200 with the consumption of a carbohydrate restricted diet in association with also having high HDL cholesterol over 80 milligrams per deciliter as well as low triglycerides which they define as under 70 uh, milligrams per deciliter. This lipid, lipid pattern differs from that that is commonly seen in obesity in which high LDLC usually is associated with other adverse lipid levels, meaning low HDL, higher triglycerides, including those with metabolic dyslipidemia, which is the clinical definition of low HDL, high, high triglycerides. So they wanted to test these hypotheses, the LDLC elevation is associated with both the leanness as measured by the BMI and with metabolic health, which is evidenced by the low ratio of triglycerides to HDL, which we know is a great cardiovascular risk marker, triglyceride to HDL ratio. And if they had that in a good range and also good BMI and yet had the very high levels of LDLC, they wanted to examine those people. So they looked at uh, adults consuming a carbohydrate restricted diet. In addition, they explored in a case series whether a moderate increase in their carbs within the context of still being carbohydrate restricted might help to ameliorate this LDLC elevation. Are you interested still? This is a really fascinating study and I'm really glad it's out there. All right, so let's look at the methods. The respondents to the web survey were informed that their uh, data was anonymous and may be used in a scientific report. Patients in the case series provided written informed consent for the publication of the data, reviewing of existing aggregate data previously collected by survey and case reports for the purposes of this study. Uh, and it was, uh, I guess, passed through the Institutional Review Board at Boston Children's Hospital, which is where Dr. Ludwig is employed. The web survey called the Cholesterol Super Survey is a publicly available ongoing questionnaire created by Dave Feldman in January of 2020 with the aim of describing changes in LDLC amongst consumers of carbohydrate restriction. The survey advertised through social media includes questions about height, weight, dietary intake, medications, and current and past lipid test results. A copy of the survey uh, is available and responses used in this manuscript were collected between January 16th and November 30th, 2020. Okay, inclusion criteria. This is what you had to show them in order to be a part of this study. Current consumption of a carbohydrate restricted diet with 130 grams of, of uh, carbohydrate daily um, or less, obviously. Uh, not taking any kind of lipid lowering medications, things like statins and fibrates and PCSK9A, uh, 9I, um, all of those kinds of things. You can't be taking anything that would artificially lower your cholesterol. Most recent lipid data on carbohydrate restricted diet provided, including LDLC, 
HDLC triglycerides as well as lipid data from prior to current. So they wanted to see, are we seeing a trend where your numbers are going in a different direction before carbohydrate restriction and since you started carbohydrate restriction? They wanna see that data. Lipid test on carbohydrate restricted diet obtained in 2018 or later. Current and prior lipid tests obtained within five years of one another. Current and prior lipid tests obtained after a fast of 12 to 16 hours. And the exclusion, exclusion uh, criteria were uh, respondents with reported ages of under 18 or over 100. So they didn't want kids and they didn't want old geezers because when you get over 100, you got all kind of stuff keeping you alive and we don't want that to be a confounding variable. Also, respondents reporting potentially unreliable data if the BMI is under 10 or over 50. LDLC if it's under 30 or over 1,000, HDLC under 20 or over 200, triglycerides under 20 or over 1,500. All right, uh, they have this section called descriptive uh, statistics, but it's all nerdy math language that I don't think will be very interesting. Uh, exploratory analyses and regression models to identify factors associated with LDL changes, LDLC changes. We ran a linear model with all lipid and anthropometric factors in a data set other than the current LDLC. Subsequently, we evaluated the relevance of potential non LDLC factors associated with the change, analyzed the contribution, blah, 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 blah. That's kind of boring, too. Uh, let's get to the good part. Uh, Low Carb New Yorker says, I love this. Going to see my cardiologist today to discuss my blood work. Cool. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. All right. So here's an important part of this study. They wanted to identify and characterize the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. So if they're trying to identify that there's a specific group of people that are these lean mass hyperresponders, here's how they determine that. So to characterize this phenotype, we used previously proposed criteria. LDLC needs to be more than 200. HDLC needs to be uh, over 80. And triglycerides need to be under 70. For comparison to non lean mass uh, hyper responders, uh, statistical significance threshold was established at 0 0.05 and evaluated by the Mann Whitney U test. Comparison BMI plots, including distribution curves and violin box plots, were created. It's a lot of scientific geekiness, but stick with me here. Uh, so they looked at all those data and stuck them through this, this little algorithm to spit out who would fit this category. So that's how they did that. Sample size and statistical power assessment. Due to the descriptive nature of our study, no outcome-based sample size was established beforehand. However, we estimate the sample size is large enough to detect that there are differences between the different groups. Uh, the raw data uh, from the web survey and the step-by-step -step comment code for reproducing both quantitative and graphical analysis are available publicly. I will show on the screen the URL for people watching. If you want to go look it up, github.com slash Adrian Soto M slash LMHR if you want to go look at that raw data. A lot of people ask me, Jimmy, how do you get such good deep sleep? Well, there's a lot of things that I do, but one of the newest things that I recently added is this upgraded magnesium from a company called Upgraded Formulas. Go to their website, upgradedformulas.com, and you can learn all about this nano uh, technology that they use for this particular mineral of magnesium. Again, it's called Upgraded Magnesium, and it's got all the different forms of magnesium in it using the nanotechnology so it gets absorbed a lot better. Guys, I have seen my deep sleep improve by as much as 30 to 40% simply by adding in this product along with sunshine exposure, darkness in the room, cooler temperature, all of the things that I always have done. So again, upgradedformulas.com is the website. Go check them out. Case series. Patients presenting to the clinic uh, with a history of elevated LDLC following an initiation of a very low carbohydrate diet containing less than 25 grams of carbs and no personal history of myocardial infarction or stroke 
were initially counseled on standard of care pharmacologic options to lower the LDLC. In other words, they were told about statin drugs, about all these other cholesterol lowering uh, things like statins. Patients included in this series refused pharmacotherapy. They said, nope, don't wanna take any drugs. What else you got? And instead they opted to pursue an empiric clinic, uh, clinician supervised dietary approach. And the dietary approach to try to help with these lean mass hyper responders was reintroducing upwards of 50 to 100 grams of carbs daily in the forms of primarily fruit and starchy foods. Body fat percentages were also uh, taken with a four point bio impedance scale. All right, so what were the results? Survey respondents reported markedly elevated LDLC and optimal triglyceride to HDL ratio. They had 903 respondents. 24 reported available carbohydrate intake at greater than 130 grams, or excuse me, less than 130 grams per day, uh, indicating that the sample was primarily composed, oh, sorry, greater than. I get those little, those little symbols mixed up, greater than. So 24 of the 903 were over 130 grams. Everybody else was under that, meaning they were primarily low carb dieters and very low carb dieters. Another 282 were also excluded uh, which ended up with 597 for analysis. The mean age was 51.3 years old. 90% of the respondents were between 31 and 69. 60% of them male. The average BMI was 24. Available carb intake was 27 grams per day. That's pretty darn very low carb. Mean current LDLC was 238. So that's uh, over that 200 that they wanted. Prior LDLC before they went on a low carb diet was 146. So you can see that it's gone up almost a full 100 points since going on low carb. The average triglyceride to HDL ratio was 1.1, which means pretty close to that one to one ratio between the two, which is at the optimal level. It's also very expected when you go on a carbohydrate restricted diet. Typically, you'll see HDL cholesterol 70 or higher. You'll see triglycerides uh, at 70 or lower. And that's that one-to-one -one ratio between those two numbers. Perfect for the number that you're looking for. The average time between the cholesterol test, the lipid test, was 446 days. So just over a year and a few months. All right. Leanness and metabolic health are associated with large LDLC increases on carbohydrate restricted diets. So in a hypothesis uh, naive uh, multiple linear regression model using a bootstrap uh, AIC consistency diagnosis, I don't know what any of that means, just stick with me. Low BMI was consistently 100% of the random samples associated with the LDLC increase on a carbohydrate restricted diet. In other words, everyone that had low BMI and had that triglyceride to HDL, HDL ratio and the really good thing, every single one of them, 100% in the random samples that they looked at, all of them saw increases in their LDLC. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Low triglycerides and high HDL predicted greater increases in LDLC. Now that's what we're looking at because typically when you're looking at, at metabolic syndrome, low triglycerides, good thing, high uh, HDL cholesterol, good thing, but then they expect to see lower LDLC, but what they saw was exactly the opposite in these people. Triglyceride to HDLC ratio was strong and highly significant as a predictor, although this relationship was, was attenuated when you also include the current BMI. So they wanted to explore this finding. They examined the ability of prior lipids to predict current BMI, whereas both triglycerides and HDLC were strongly associated in the expected directions. The association with LDLC was null, categorized by quartiles. These relationships are nearly uh, monotonic along both of the axes. Comparing respondents in the low BMI and lowest triglyceride to HDL quartiles to those in the highest BMI and the highest triglyceride to HDL quartiles, LDLC increased by an average of 134 
versus 40 for those with the higher HDL and lower or, or higher triglyceride and lower HDL. That's a 3.4 fold relative difference. Analyzing all cases with a BMI above 25, LDLC, uh, the change was just 49 milligrams per deciliter, with 27 actually showing a decrease in the LDLC. Similar relationships were also obtained with the use of triglyceride HDL ratio during consumption of carbohydrate restricted diets. All right, so they compared the all around performance of the four models to explain LDLC change on a carbohydrate restricted diet. They did uh, number one, prior HDLC and triglycerides. Number two, prior triglyceride to HDL ratio. Number three, BMI. And number four, prior triglyceride to HDL plus BMI. They're trying to see what which of those formulas is going to predict that there would be an, an elevation in the LDLC. They're trying to help these lean mass hyper responders. What is the thing that's gonna help us identify that you're in this category? Uh, what they found was including BMI perform better than triglyceride to HDL ratio, but when you do triglyceride to HDL ratio plus BMI, that was the best indicator for figuring out who fits this category of lean mass hyper responder with LDLC. So as a parallel approach for identifying the most important predictors of LDLC, uh, large LDLC changes on carbohydrate restricted diets without use of any preconceived definition, a machine learning regression tree was developed. BMI emerged as the first branch point uh, and is an independent and weight threshold uh, naive fashion. Prior HDL, C and triglycerides were also identified as meaningful branches Age and sex didn't even make the branches. Okay, so let's get to the next part of the study. Lean mass hyper responders have a similar pre-diet LDLC versus the non-responders. As the patterns emerge from the hypothesis naive uh, analysis were reminiscent of the lean mass hyper responder phenotype, we also used the uh, beforehand cutoffs as described in the methods to select respondents who had all of the criteria for the phenotype. That was a total of 112 of the respondents. They looked at the mean LDLC, their average, HDLC and triglycerides for the lean mass hyper responder on a carbohydrate restricted diet. Those people, they saw a level of 316 for, uh, bu -bu -bu -bu, for their LDLC. That's very high, very, very high. As compared to the non-lean mass hyper responders, which was 485 people in the study, they were similar in age, slightly more likely to be female. Notably, the lean mass hyper responder group had markedly lower BMI, 21.9 compared to 24.5, and a larger median LDLC increase it increased by 143 milligrams per deciliter in that population versus the 63 uh, in the other group. With regards to baseline lipid data, lean mass hyper responders had higher HDLC and lower triglycerides, but similar LDLC. Although lean mass hyper responders had much higher LDLC on a carbohydrate restricted diet, uh, the average prior to that were identical. In other words, they're saying, look, the carbohydrate restricted diet did something to them to make their LDLC go way up. That's that hyper responder that we're talking about here. Recognizing the highly selected nature of the sample, we compared BMI and lipid values both before and after they started a low carb diet on our respondents to the NHANES data. Overall, respondents were much leaner. They also had higher LDLC and HDLC as well as lower triglycerides, all correlated with differences in their BMI. The differences in the BMI, LDLC, HDLC, and triglycerides were most pronounced uh, pronounced in those lean mass hyper responders. Okay, here is the intervention, you guys. How did they help these lean mass hyper responders maybe start to lower some of that elevation in the LDLC with their low triglyceride, 
triglycerides with their higher HDL, with their very low BMI, how did they get them to fix the LDLC going wackadoodle on them? Let's take a look. Five patients consuming a very low carb diet with less than 25 grams a day of carbohydrate presented to primary care practice with LDLC ranging from 239 was the lowest one. The highest one was 665, representing extreme elevations from their pre-diet levels. Genetic testing for familial hypercholesterolemia was negative in each case, uh, so I'm glad they ran that. There is this test called uh, Ambry Genetics, runs the uh, FH test, so you can see if it's a genetic thing, and it came back not genetic. All of the patients refused statin therapy. They instead chose to pursue a clinician-supervised protocol with the reintroduction of 50 to 100 grams per day of carbohydrate. Case histories of each patient are included in the supplemental to this study. Uh, this dietary in intervention was associated with a large decrease, so they added in the 50 to 100 grams of carbs a day. It, it led to a large decrease in the LDLC in all of the patients, ranging from 100 milligram per deciliter drop to 480 milligrams per deciliter drop. The two patients who met the criteria for lean mass hyperresponders showed the largest increases in LDLC upon initiation of very low carb and the largest reductions in LDLC with moderate introduction of carbohydrate. I love this, by the way. And yes, I'm a keto guy. Yes, I have pushed low carb diets for over a decade and a half. But I think we don't need to be so dogged in our belief system that we miss the forest for the trees. What was it about reintroducing carbohydrate that brought the LDLC down in these lean mass hyper responders? It's pretty fascinating when you stop and think about it. It kind of throws a monkey wrench in the, well, just cut your carbs and all your health woes go away. Now, again, I would want to know what is that LDLC that is elevated doing to these people? We don't know. That's the problem. But we do know it's out of line, especially the one that had the 600 plus LDLC. That's astronomically high. And why play with fire if you can do something nutritionally that would bring that back into line while still maintaining all of the other numbers. And it looks like that's what they've done. All right, so let's get to the discussion part of this study. The results of this study suggest that a large elevation of LDLC on a carbohydrate restricted diet is more likely to occur in people who are lean and metabolically healthy. Low triglyceride to HDL ratio prior to the consumption of current uh, carbohydrate restricted diet and low BMI were all strongly associated with that larger LDLC increase. Moreover, they found evidence to support the existence of a lean mass hyperresponder phenotype using a, an a priori, meaning beforehand, definition characterizing individuals with unremarkable baseline LDLC and marked LDLC elevation on a carbohydrate restricted diet. In other words, they didn't have this issue before they started low carb and then they developed it after they started eating low carb. This phenotype contrasts with the usual pattern of dyslipidemia observed in populations at a high risk uh, and, and in which normal to high LDLC occurs with high triglycerides and low HDL. In other words, they're saying usually you see this kind of elevation in LDLC with people with low triglycerides and high, uh, or, or excuse me, high triglycerides and low HDL, but this is happening in people with just the opposite and with low BMI and with not having insulin resistance and actually having just the opposite, insulin sensitivity, lean mass. They're not supposed to see an elevation in their LDLC. So the significance of the LDLC that's elevated in the context of these good metabolic health markers warrants further consideration. As the prevalence of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome increase, alongside a global downward trend in LDLC, mostly uh, due to pharmacology like statin medications, a high triglyceride to HDL ratio and an LDLC profile characterized by small dense LDL particles now com uh, comprise the dominant dyslipidemia amongst those with cardiovascular disease risk. Our respondents uh, showed all exactly the opposite pattern. 
I can't underscore this enough, you guys. A lean mass hyper responder, very healthy, all of the markers in their blood looking like they're the most spectacularly healthy people in the world. They're eating a low carb ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, you name the diet that's carbohydrate restricted. They go see their doctor and the doctor runs their cholesterol numbers and they pop a 330 for their LDL and it makes their total cholesterol 420. What is the doctor going to do? He's going to about pass out probably first. And then he's going to say, oh, you're at great risk of heart disease. We've got to get you on a statin medication. When that's not what, what was needed at all. They showed in this study, all it took was just a slight little increase in carbohydrate, still staying in the low carb range, and yet knocking their LDL cholesterol down significantly just with that little bit of a reintroduction of carbohydrate. What it tells me, you guys, is we don't know as much about lipids as we think we do. So why, again, are we putting all of the onus of heart disease risk on LDLC, on total cholesterol? Those things aren't as meaningful as they're making it out to be. And yet to this very day here in 2022, we're still having to live in the world of nonsense pretending like those things mean something when they really, really don't. Uh, let's see. Our respondents showed the opposite pattern. Recent data from the Women's Heart Study, a large prospective trial assessing risk factors for cardiovascular uh, risk, found that uh, insulin resistance dyslipidemia, which includes high triglycerides and low HDL, may contribute more to cardiovascular risk then the high LDLC, which is what I was just saying, there's other factors involved that are much more important than high LDLC. Did you go keto and thought you had to give up wine? Well, let me introduce you to Dry Farm Wines. It is the world's first sugar-free alcohol that is lower than your typical wines, organic, made at local farms that do it the right way. Most of the wines that you buy are from three really big companies loaded with additives and preservatives, so many dozens of those kinds of things. You don't want all that junk in your wine. So go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and they will ship you these wines. And just because you listen to this podcast, Dry Farm Wines is going to give you a bottle in your first order for just one cent. Go to dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy and uh, you will get your bottle of wine for just one singular penny. Go check them out. Dry Farm Wines, you guys. It's wine o'clock somewhere. Let's go get In the some Scandinavian uh, Simivastatin survival study, individuals with isolated elevated LDLC compared with those who had tri high triglycerides and low HDL were at lower risk for coronary events and benefited less from taking statins, finding that's consistent with other studies. In other words, their high LDLC was not as relevant as the triglyceride to HDL ratio, as the pure amount of tri triglycerides being higher and HDL being lower. Those were the things that mattered. And look guys, this isn't new. I put this in my book a decade ago that we need to be paying closer attention to tri triglyceride or HDL ratio. And here we are, 2022, just now figuring out, oh, uh, I guess we should pay attention to triglycerides and HDL and LDLC is not as important. Hmm, where have I heard that before? <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. Furthermore, a uh, carbohydrate restricted diet tends to increase the LDL particle size. So it goes back to that NMR lipoprofile test we were talking about earlier. And you can have that run. It's $130 out of pocket because I run it quite a bit and have in the past run it quite a bit. And it's worth every penny because you get to see the total LDLP number, which is the number of particles, and then the preponderance of what the particles are. Are they large fluffy or are they small dense? And they tease out what that small dense is. Kariana says, didn't Dave Feldman talk about this as he is on those lean mass hyperresponder folks? This is his study. Uh, Dave is a part of this study, along with Dr. David Ludwig and Dr. Tro and Dr. Nick uh, Norwitz. Yeah, yeah. So sorry you missed that at the beginning, Kariana. But yes, this is Dave's study. 
Um, in some circumstances, an elevated LDLC on a carbohydrate restricted diet may be associated with a reduced small LDL particle. How about that? You have a higher LDLC, and yet when you look at the NMR, they have next to no small dense LDL particles, which does not surprise me because a proxy uh, marker on your standard lipid panel for small dense LDL particles being low is triglycerides being under 70 and HDL being over 70. When those two things are in existence and you've got that one-to-one -one or better ratio, you almost it's almost impossible that you would have high amounts of the small dense LDL particles. However, these data cannot exclude the important possibility of an increase of cardiovascular risk associated with an elevated LDLC. In other words, we just don't know what it means. We have believed for so long that an elevated LDLC meant something in your heart health, and it's it's actually never been proven one way or the other, especially with those who have severe elevations, and that's why we need a study on those people. One major interpretive issue of our observational study includes selection bias. The sample had substantially lower BMI, also better triglyceride to HDL ratio, compared to the national representative data in the United States. Participants were previously aware of their LDLC change by virtue of the study design. In other words, they were looking for people that had that kind of a change. Thus, the findings are not generally uh, uh, directly generalizable. Nevertheless, even with a sample bias towards leanness and towards good metabolic health markers, they still found a sufficient enough change to observe strong associations over a large range in LDLC response to a carbohydrate restricted diet. If these associations were extrapolatable, uh, if, you, if they could extrapolate it to a broader population, we would expect an even smaller increase in LDLC amongst individuals with higher BMI as compared to the median LDLC increases observed among those with the highest BMI and triglyceride to HDL uh, quantiles. Such individuals are more characteristics of, uh, characteristic of patients with diet-related chronic disease, things like type 2 diabetes, for whom a carbohydrate-restricted diet holds particular interest. This is interesting, you guys, because what they're saying is these very healthy people, these very lean, very healthy metabolically people, they found their numbers with their LDLC went astronomically high, and they're looking at the other people that have lower HDL and higher triglycerides, and their LDLC tends to kind of be in a normal range. When if we're using that as the parameter for putting people on medications, using that as the parameter for determining cardiovascular risk, is it really a reliable marker? Is it something that's actually going to be predictive of heart disease? And I think they're trying to make the case, no. It is not a predictor of anything of the sort. The possibility is consistent with several clinical trials of a carbohydrate-restricted diet involving participants with obesity or type 2 diabetes in which little or no LDLC increase occurred. And so they're not seeing that big change. Changes in saturated fat were not measured in this study and may have contributed to any individual increase in LDLC. However, this possibility implies that an inverse association between BMI and saturated fat intake exists. This alternative explanation presupposes the leaner participants with low triglyceride to HDL ratio preferentially consumed substantially more saturated fat than participants with the higher BMI and triglyceride to HDL ratio. You, you can't possibly know that. There would be no way to know that without a food log, unless this was a randomized controlled trial that they put them in a metabolic ward and they watched what they ate and they controlled what they ate and they, they marked all of that down. They just can't know. We believe instead that a more likely explanation involves physiological mechanisms related directly to energy metabolism. By analogy, SGLT2 inhibitors, which promote fat oxidation and ketosis, Increase the LDLC and interestingly also reduce your cardiovascular risk by raising the possibility that a shift in substrate oxidation from carbohydrate to fat will intrinsically elevate the LDLC. Thus, reducing intake of carbohydrate increases systemic trafficking of the lipid energy 
through VLDL lineage particles uh, coincident with high lipoprotein lipase mediated remodeling of the VLDL into LDL and HDL. That's a lot of scientific gobbledygook to say the precursors to LDL go up and thus it's not a surprise to see in these people with the hyper response of the LDL having those precursors go up turning into higher LDL and HDL by the way. So this is where they get their higher HDL and then with the higher HDL that's usually accompanied with a lower triglyceride and then they also get the bump in the LDL-C. We speculate that this effect may be the greatest in people who are lean, insulin sensitive and have high energy demands. A possibility consistent with other research but further investigation is warranted. Regarding other limitations of this study, we did not conduct a detailed dietary assessment, which I talked about. If they do a randomized controlled trial, put them in a metabolic ward, you can actually keep very detailed uh, results. So we can't uh, assess any other contributing influences beyond saturated fat on the lipids. In addition, data were collected by self-report and bias due to misreporting cannot be excluded, which we've talked about in previous studies. In contrast to lab data to which respondents may have, direct, may have direct access, recall of prior BMI may be especially susceptible to bias. In our survey, we did not interrogate prior BMI and therefore further study will be needed uh, to use BMI for prognostic purposes. This issue would not apply to the predictive associations involved with prior lipids, nor to the characterization of the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. One of the strengths of this study is its large sample size with excellent power to test beforehand hypotheses, including uh, hypothesis naive exploratory models. Despite issues of generalization, the survey findings receive some clinical support from patient case series. Furthermore, they've made all the data <coughs> and the analysis codes publicly available so that people can also further analyze and investigate. So the conclusion of this study, the results of this study identify major potential sources of heterogeneity in LDLC response to carbohydrate restricted diets. This finding suggests that patients with obesity and related disease for whom a carbohydrate restricted diet may hold special promise may be at the lowest risk of experiencing a clinically significant increase in LDLC with this dietary intervention. That is good news. Because one of the things that doctors scare their patients away from who need to lose weight, oh, don't do that low carb diet, don't do that ketogenic diet, don't do that carnivore diet, that paleo diet, because it will raise your cholesterol. This makes the argument that no, that's not true. Your LDL will not go way up if you're in that category where you have extra, B, uh, extra weight on your body and higher BMI. It's those who are in the lower BMI that need to be concerned, at least with the higher levels of LDLC. Whether it means anything or not, we don't know yet. You'll actually see uh, improvements in cardiovascular risk, uh, risk marker like dyslipidemia, lipoprotein insulin resistance, and LP little a. In contrast, lean physical act, active, physically active individuals may be uniquely susceptible to LDLC on a carbohydrate restricted diet. Prospective observational research and interventional studies will need uh, will be needed to explore these findings and assess the associations and causal mechanisms. So uh, they gave a, an acknowledgement at the end to Penny, Chris Etherton, and Walter Willett from the Harvard School of Public Health for a critical review of the manuscript um, and some other people for their work on the study. Um, but yeah, guys, what a study. If you hadn't seen this one yet, go check it out. It's in the journal Current Developments in Nutrition. It was published in November of 2021. Elevated LDL cholesterol with a carbohydrate-restricted diet. Evidence for a lean mass hyperresponder phenotype. Just Google that title into, take a screenshot, and uh, Google that into uh, a search engine and you'll be able to find the study and you can see for yourself and you can look at all the tables and all the everything that came with it so you can analyze this even further. But 
Good news for people that want to go on a low-carb ketogenic diet and they're concerned about elevations in LDLC if they're if they have a higher BMI, there's no concern. And then knowing that you're not losing your mind if you have a good BMI and you have good triglyceride to HDL ratio, but your LDLC goes up, you're not losing your mind. They showed 100 percent of those people in this study saw their LDLC go up. Lean mass hyper responder. Thank you to Dave Feldman for putting that vernacular out there. And Dave is just, he's done an incredible job. I remember meeting Dave before he was Dave Feldman online. He came up to me at a low carb event in Denver and he was like, you're Jimmy Moore. How about this? And he just started like spitting out all of this stuff at me. And I'm like, dude, I just got off a plane. Can I like chill a second? <laughs> but I ended up connecting him with Steve Finney uh, and some other people. And now he's off to the races and actually has published studies now. So kudos to Dave. And uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful job. Excited to see what else comes out from that group. But guys, thank you so much for watching here today. As always, uh, if you want to see these when I'm doing them live before they air on my podcast, Go over to Jimmy Makes Science Simple over on Instagram, and I go live uh, and do these, and I'll announce there uh, when I will do a study, so like I did this one here today. So thanks so much for listening, and I hope this helps you out, uh, helped you learn a few things, and uh, yeah, we'll keep doing these. I love exposing studies, sharing the good, the bad, the ugly about studies, so Keep your eyes open if you don't understand studies and you see a study out there that you want me to help interpret, go ahead and send me a DM through Jimmy Make Science Simple and uh, we will take a look at that study. So until next time, guys, we'll see you then. Time to get inspiration from the Living La Vida Low Carb Show. Hey, the Living Low Carb Show.com. Woo! Have you experienced the dreaded keto flu? Did you know that most of these symptoms are actually due to your body dumping excess electrolytes? This is where Element comes in. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low carb, or paleo diet. Element contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. With none of the junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. Everyone needs electrolytes, especially those on low-carb diets, or if you practice intermittent or extended fasting, if you're physically active or sweat a lot, Add Element today and see how much better you feel and perform. Use the URL drinklmnt.com slash Jimmy.